deeper side, he's a good person. You don't have to do the crimes now. You know, and I feel like I should be given to shot because I'm in a better place than I was. I appreciate that, but I think it's time that he gets a taste of something else because I just can't with that history. I can see that my brother just felt betrayed at the time when he was pleading and saying that he was in a better place. Defendant Dion Brennan attacking his judge, and now he's due in court today for the assault. And a father and son are facing murder charges after taking the law into their own hands and killing a trespasser. Plus, what's going on with the Adelsons? Will more charges be filed? It's all coming up next for you right here on Opening Statements. Good Tuesday morning to you and welcome to Opening Statements. I'm your host, Julie Grant. It's great to have you along with us. We've got a fantastic show planned for you. And if you're new to the show, thank you for being here. I think you'll find this show a lot like the actual opening statements at trial. That's how we designed it, to get you all primed and ready to go to see the major trials that we're broadcasting on Court TV Live and then all the major cases in true crime that you want to know about. We talk about them on this show. So right now, it's time for you to grab a cup of coffee because it's time for my opening statement. <music> to give him bond or not to give him bond? That is the question a Las Vegas judge will be answering when the man who's accused of killing iconic rapper Tupac Shakur appears in court today. Dwayne Keefe D. Davis wants out of jail. He's been held there since his arrest back in September for the 1996 murder of the beloved rapper. His arrest was calm and quiet. It happened while it looked like he was out on his morning walk. The guy is 60 years old now and he's a cancer patient. And his attorneys say that he's not a flight risk or a danger to the community. But is he a danger to the case witnesses? I'd answer that question with a resounding yes. Prosecutors have been listening to his jail calls and have become very concerned that Keefe D told his son about a green light authorization. Prosecutors say that was permission to kill. Now, if I'm one of those prosecutors today, I am jumping up and down in front of the judge to try to keep this guy locked up because the witnesses in the case are already so few. Everyone in those cars when Tupac was shot, except for Keefe D and Suge Knight, are dead. Other gang members who have information about the incident, who are fortunate enough to still be alive today, are going to be critical to this case. So even though Keefe D is older, his track record is one of a lifetime of crime. And now that the rest of his life is on the line, why would he turn into a choir boy all of a sudden? This guy was a high-ranking member of one of Los Angeles' most violent gangs, the Southside Compton Crips. This man is a self-described hardened gangster, and he rose up the ranks to become a shot caller. Should we be foolish enough to think this guy is going to play nice now? Come on. He needs to stay where he is so that his every move can be monitored in the jail. And if we see at trial that he did not order the, Murdoch, uh, the, the murder of Tupac Shakur, as investigators say he did, then he should be set free. If he didn't order the murder of Tupac Shakur, he should absolutely go free. Of course, that's how this country works, right? It's only allegations at this point. It's not a conviction. But these are very serious charges levied against him. And Tupac Shakur deserves justice. So I say no bond reductions, and as a matter of fact, I'd go so far as to say no bond at all for Keefe D. That's how I see the case. That's my opening statement. Let me know what you think right now. I want to give you what's on your daily docket. In accordance with the laws of state of Nevada, this court... Oh, No, 
Oh my, here's a look at some of the cases we're following over you today on Court TV in Nevada. Dio Barrett and that guy, his initial appearance on the case for the assault of the judge is set for 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. We will take you there live when that happens. And also happening in Nevada, guess who's going to be in court? Dwayne Keefe D. Davis. That's right. Today is the day for his bond hearing. That's when he goes before the judge at noon. So we'll take you in there live when that happens. And in Ohio, jury selection begins today in the retrial in the pizza delivery murder case. The defendant in that one is Erica Stefanko. Now, court TV has boots on the ground for you all across the country. Our Matt Johnson is joining us live in the studio and our Chanley Painter is standing by live in Akron, Ohio. We begin with Court TV Crime and Justice correspondent Matt Johnson was the very latest on the Adelsons. Matt, good morning. That soap opera, Julie, good morning. The Adelsons, they just can't stop talking. In fact, Charlie and his mom Donna spoke on the phone for 35 hours after his conviction and before her arrest at the airport. The hearing in her case was scheduled for today. It's been postponed due to weather. Donna Adelson now facing charges in the murder of her ex-son-in-law, Dan Markell. In the jailhouse calls between the two obtained by Court TV, Charlie is talking about how he felt the jury makeup didn't represent him. That led to his conviction. He called himself a highly intelligent person, called the jury overweight and inbred. In one phone call, Donna talked about making arrangements for the future. Take a listen. <laughs> Anything. I mean, I, you know, they, they looked at me like, you know, like some guy that's making five million dollars a year. Yeah. I won't. I know you won't. Well, they're not finished. This family. You're just the start. Now, as for the Adelson family. Donna now facing the same charges her son was convicted of. She has pled not guilty. No charges for Wendy or Harvey. Charlie is serving life behind bars without the possibility of parole, Julie. Matt Johnson, live in our studio this morning. Thank you for that update. I know you'll keep us posted if you hear more about any other Adelsons being charged. We'll talk about them a little more later in the show. In the meantime, let's turn now to Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who's in Akron, Ohio this morning with the latest on the jury selection in the retrial in the pizza delivery murder case. Chanley. Hey, good morning, Julie. Around 60 prospective jurors have been summoned to be at this courthouse later today for jury selection in the much anticipated retrial for Erica Stefanko. Back in 2020, Stefanko was convicted after three days of jury deliberations on aggravated murder and murder charges for her part in the brutal killing of 25 year old mother Ashley Biggs. Ashley was locked in a bitter custody battle with Stefanko's husband at the time, Chad Cobb. Cobb pleaded guilty to Biggs' murder in 2013, but Stefanko is accused of being the one who made the bogus pizza delivery call in order to lure Ashley, who was working as a pizza delivery driver, to a remote location where Chad Cobb could beat and strangle her to death. The court is issuing a life sentence with parole eligibility after 30 years. But Stefanko's conviction and sentence would be overturned in 2022 in large part due to the trial judge's error in allowing Chad Cobb, who was serving a life sentence for Ashley's murder, to testify against Stefanko remotely from prison due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Was Ashley already dead? Yes, sir. Did you strangle her? I'm not the one who strangled her, sir. And Chad Cobb will testify again this time in person. But first, Julie, these parties have to impanel that jury of 12 with six alternates. And once a jury is seated, they will go in a jury view of the crime scenes associated with this case. For now, I'll send it back to you. All right. Our thanks to Chanley Painter for that early update this morning. We want to turn now to the high profile murder case of mother Jennifer Dulos. Defendant Michelle Traconis is preparing to go to trial this week. She's charged with conspiracy to commit murder, tampering with physical evidence, hindering prosecution and more. All in connection with the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos. The mother of five vanished back in 2019 after dropping her children off at school. Her remains to this day have never been found. Authorities believe that Jennifer was killed by her estranged husband, Fotis Dulos, who was later charged with her murder and then died by suicide. Now Jennifer's family is hoping for justice as Traconis, who is accused of helping cover up the murder, is heading to trial. So this morning, we want to talk about how prosecutors will prove this murder occurred and 
whether Jennifer's remains will ever be found. I want to bring in our expert guest now, forensic death investigator, professor, and the host of the Body Bags podcast, Joseph Scott Morgan. Good morning, Joe. Nice to see you. I'm sure you have lots of theories on this case as to how Jennifer Dulos was killed. Would you share with us your thoughts, please? Uh, well, you know, uh, one of the one of the precepts in in any murder trial is this idea of the corpus delecti, right? And here in in our case that we're discussing this morning, uh, there is no body at this point in time. The, really, the, the only evidence that we have uh, as far as leads back uh, to Jennifer and this violent death uh, that she uh, was subjected to is blood evidence that's found uh, in the vehicle and some at the home as well. And so it's kind of this thin thread that the prosecutors are going to have to hang their hat on moving forward with this case. Right, Professor. And understanding that there was blood in the house, does that tell you that it's most likely that the killing occurred in the home or at least the start of some kind of assault? Uh, yeah, yeah, it would. And Julie, I, I got to tell you, one of the one of the things, and you 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 understand this from a prosecutorial standpoint. Uh, there's blood, and then there's blood. Uh, you begin to think about, uh, you know, we use terms in forensics uh, where if blood is spilled at a scene, uh, a forensic pathologist, absent of a body, might opine that this volume of blood that is left behind is essentially incompatible with life, uh, which means that this amount of blood that is spilled gives you an indication that the person did not survive. I think that that's one of the things that they're going to discuss. We'll be able to see the evidence that they found that's going to have linkage uh, back to her and, uh, and maybe the movement in the house that took place. Remember, there was blood found in a vehicle as well. So did this attack uh, which they are alleging occurred in the home, this violent attack initiate within the home. And then her body after her death uh, was removed through the house and placed in the vehicle. And that's going to give you kind of the dynamics of this event. And essentially the only thing that you kind of have leading the way is going to be this trail of blood. Right. Professor Joe, do you think there's any chance at this point that Jennifer Dulos's remains will ever be recovered so that her children can properly grieve her? Very difficult, uh, Julie. I think that the one person that has uh, that knowledge uh, is the person that's currently accused. Uh, if she was, in fact, involved in this from a logistic standpoint, and what Dulos, Foytus Dulos did, uh, if she was aware of these intimate details, she might be, unfortunately, the only key that's going to unlock that great mystery. I hate that for the family, uh, you know, moving forward with their lives to try to be able to memorialize uh, this poor woman. Uh, I, I think that it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be an uphill challenge. If it was any other circumstances where you had the primary suspect in a case that had not taken their own life, I'd say there's a better chance. But the fact that he is no longer here on this earth is going to be problematic. Yeah, it sure is. Police say he was dumping trash bags while yeah. Michelle Traconis is in the truck, but she doesn't ask any questions, according to her, uh, wondering why he's going to dumpsters all around. Uh, it's it's just uh, deplorable, uh, these facts, as you know, Professor Joe. We'll leave it there for now, but this case is set to start up this week on Thursday, and we will take it live when it does. Professor Joseph Scott Morgan's going to come along with us as we head to what's trending in true crime. I want you to do the same. Here's what we've got next. It will have been looking it up over and over. Could things change if there is extradition from Vietnam? Because we, we've looked at all the places. I mean, I could go to Korea and China, but there's no extradition. But looking at the places, there's no extradition. Oh, we're examining the Adelson family this morning. Charlie's filing his appeal, and we're wondering what's next for Mom Madonna as her hearing today was rescheduled. Plus, we're bringing you up to speed on the trial for a father and son who were accused of stabbing their neighbor for trespassing on their property. Thanks for watching Opening Statements. Tonight on Court TV. These are the big cases that everyone is talking about. A lot of new
new developments taking place. Shocking. I know who killed John Bonet, to say the least. You cannot make this stuff up. It's uh, unreal. The scene of the double murders is behind us right here. Things are happening. The investigation is continuing. Closing arguments with Vinny Politan tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. As to the matter of the arraignment, does your client waive the reading of the indictment? Yes, Your Honor. How does she plead? Not guilty, Your Honor. Not guilty plea is entered for the record. Now into what's trending in true crime. Donna Adelson was set to appear in court today, but her case management hearing has been postponed due to severe weather in the Tallahassee area. So the hearing would have been Adelson's third court appearance in Leon County Court since her arrest back in November. Court documents showing search warrants were filed and signed on Friday for two computers seized from the Adelson's home the day after Donna's arrest. So that's interesting. This is prosecutors continue their case against the Adelson family's matriarch. But as the state continues building its case against mom and Donna, our question this morning is simple. What's next for her? What might we see in this case? Let's bring in our power panel. Still with me, forensic death investigator, professor at Jacksonville State University, and the host of the Body Bags podcast, Joseph Scott Morgan. Former prosecutor and defense attorney, Carl Steinbeck is with us. And the state attorney in Palm Beach County, Florida, Dave Ehrenberg with us as well. Good morning to you gentlemen. What a panel we have today with all of you here. Uh, so what do we think we will see next in the case against Donna. Dave Ehrenberg, may I start with you, please? As we know, uh, Danny Markell, the victim in this case, the man this case is all about, was a dear friend and classmate of yours. And I know you certainly want to see justice for him. Uh, your thoughts this morning, please, Dave. Hey, good morning, Julie, and to the panel. I'm here in beautiful Tallahassee this week for the opening of the legislative session, and that coincides with the hearing that was supposed to take place, but because of the weather, it's been postponed. I was with Jack Campbell, the state attorney, yesterday, and, and I'm convinced after speaking with him, just as I've always suspected, that you know they're going to follow the evidence, and as the evidence comes out against Donna, if it leads to Wendy, that's where they're going to go. That's why I'm intrigued about the computer, about the phone calls, about Donna's cell phones, but in the meantime, as far as Donna is concerned, uh, she's going to invoke speedy, which is to expedite things, have a speedy trial, and then it's game on, and it puts prosecutors to the tack of trying this right away. The good thing is that uh, Georgia Koppelman is, um, is very experienced at this, and she is going to be ready. In other cases, prosecutors may be caught off guard, but look, they've already done this. They've already had a dry run when it came to Charlie, and so I don't think it'll be that difficult to turn around and try Donna. You're right, Dave. Uh, that's a, a strong group of attorneys there in that office. And I know you've sung their praises many times about how diligent they are, how ethical they are. So all great things to hear as they're the ones tasked with uh, deciding whether any more Adelsons need to be charged. Carl Steinbeck, you've been all over this case. You've been talking about it, uh, you know, for uh, really um, many, many, many months uh, here, you know, throughout the trial of Charlie. Uh, tell me where you see the case this morning, if you think we're going to see Wendy and Harvey join their family members as defendants. I really do, Julie. I think that the evidence is strong against Wendy. I think it's going to continue to get stronger with more evidence that's being revealed from these search authorizations. And I think the conviction of Donna here in the, probably in May, early June time frame was going to help give them the extra motivation as well to go after the rest of them. As, as Donna has, in her own words, has said, they're coming after the rest of them. So I, I think they believe that the walls are closing in on them and the prosecution is just taking them down one at a time and it's working out really good. Sure is. Uh, they're very methodical in their approach. Uh, Professor Joseph Scott Morgan, last but certainly not least, want to get your take on the Adelsons, please. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that so much of the forensics relative to Professor Markle's uh, assassination is going to have quite the weight that it may have had in other cases prior to this. I think the forensics here and where you're really going to dig in is going to be the digital forensics. All of these communications, I found it very interesting uh, from uh, the top when you had mentioned these two computers. 
uh, that they're going to be taking a deep dive into. And I, I can imagine all of these electronic breadcrumbs are going to lead the way. Uh, these people, if nothing else, they couldn't keep their mouth shut between one another. They like to talk. And uh, I think that that could uh, very well be their undoing. You're right, Professor Joe. I, I'm sure those prosecutors in that office are busy listening to those jail calls, seeing if they're implicating each other. There's been some tension. Uh, and Professor, this is a great lead into our next topic in our trending segment here. As Charlie is appealing his murder conviction, we're wondering what this might mean for Wendy. She had this to say in a message to their mother after her brother's conviction. We know you never ask anything about your brother. This is 8 o'clock last night. But we just got off the phone with him, and the first thing he asked was, how's Wendy holding up? I didn't have the heart to tell him that you never called us or asked about him. I just said, we weren't up to phone calls right now. Everyone looks to protect you. I bet you've got a lot to think about. So she said this morning, I thought she'd be racing over here last night. Dear Mom, I know you were upset by the verdict, but the anger directed at me is not justified. I'm not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong, and I was not involved in any way with Danny's death. Also, as you know, my, I do know, my lawyer has advised me not to talk to my family or anyone else about this case. Ooh, that's cold. So in that audio clip, it's Donna reading these text messages from her daughter. Uh, we saw her testify for the state uh, as a witness against her brother, and then that call was recorded after his conviction for the killing of his former brother-in-law and Wendy's ex-husband, Dan Markell. And now Wendy seems to be creating that distance with her family members per her lawyer's advice. And we're wondering, should she be worried that she is next? Let's bring back in our power panel. Professor Joseph Scott Morgan, let me start with you please this time. How worried should Wendy be in your opinion? Uh, I think uh, significantly uh, because there are threads that uh, tie her, you know, uh, throughout this web. And, you know, just for a moment, I, you know, we, we have to think about the intimacy of what happened uh, to the professor in, in his homicide uh, and how close uh, these uh, people were that assassinated him. And this goes to a bigger picture here where you understand the movements of uh, of the professor throughout his life, his day to day life, where he would be, and you know these two people that arrive on his doorstep, uh, all the way from Miami, showing up in Tallahassee uh, to perpetrate this assassination. How do they have that information? How do they know his comings and goings? And I know that they were trailing him and all these sorts of things, but they have this information. From what does it stem? And it all goes back to the family. Sure does, Professor Joe. This is a tight family. They all seem to be very much involved in each other's business, except for the other Adelson brother that we don't hear much about. And uh, good for him distancing himself uh, from them. That seems to be a good idea, especially at the moment. Um, Carl Steinbeck, let me go to you next, please. Um, when we think about how this case has unraveled, you know, it, Wendy just seems so obvious uh, as a potential suspect because she had the most to gain here by the murder of Dan Marquez. She had more to gain than her mother, than her brother, than Catherine McBanawa, than Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera. Um, it, it seems... Uh, kind of backwards uh, that we're kind of waiting for the person most closely connected to the victim uh, to be charged here. Uh, would you share your thoughts on that, please? Well, I would have liked to seen them all arrested at the same time, but there is a, there is a one benefit by doing this piecemeal, one by one takeout approach by the state attorney's office. And that is that they are using Wendy to testify each and every time they have somebody facing these murder one charges. And every time Wendy testifies, someone gets convicted and so her testifying again against donna is likely going to be the case and so it's going to be a very very uh big thing that they can use to then go after her as uh as well as the husband of donna which is harvey and so Har harvey there's less evidence of it uh, compared to the others but there is still significant evidence and they're like i say earlier there's going to be a continual building of that evidence through these digital exams
You're right, Carl. That money drop uh, at Charlie's house where Donna and Harvey went together with the uh, literally laundered money. I, I think that's one of the most damning pieces of evidence against Harvey. Dave Ehrenberg, would you take us home, please? Uh, putting the focus back where it needs to be on your friend, uh, the brilliant Danny Markell. Uh, during the trial, you know, the Adelsons painted a picture of him that uh, many close to the family believe was very unfair, not the guy that uh, they knew and loved so much. You knew that guy. Um, what was he like? Uh, tell us a little bit more about him, if you would, please. Yeah, Julie, you've seen an outpouring of emotion and reaction from Danny's friends because he was a generally wonderful guy. He cared about people. He cared about the law, about ethics, and he had a wonderful sense of humor. So, you know, the stuff you're going to hear at, uh, at trial, look, I, I, I don't blame the Adelsons for trying to save themselves. Uh, that's a natural technique to try to trash the victim, uh, but the reality is different. And I was with Ruth Markell, uh, Danny's mother, at a panel recently, and Ruth talked about how the other Adelson uh, son, the one you referenced, Rob, who is estranged from the family, actually has reached out to her and has been very sympathetic to her. She would not say exactly the kind of conversations they had, but it should tell you about both the Markells, Danny, and also the Adelsons, that Rob is talking to Ruth and seems to have established a friendship with her while his own family is on trial. Wow, what a guy uh, that, that really speaks to his character. Uh, what a good guy that Rob Adelson sounds like. Uh, yeah, I definitely feel bad for him too, because as we all know, you know, in a way he's been victimized here with, you know, the stink that's been put on the family because of Charlie's conduct, Donna's alleged conduct, the suspicion uh, cloud that's swirling over his sister and his father. Uh, so good for him for showing such compassion to the Markells. We're gonna leave it there for now. Um, wanna say a, a big thanks to you all for being with us, uh, Professor Joseph Scott Morgan and Carl Steinbeck, we've got to let you both go, I believe. And Dave Ehrenberg, I believe you're going to be coming along with us. Oh, I have to say goodbye to you too, Dave, I'm being told. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. I love talking to you all. Thanks for making time for us here on Opening Statements. And when we come back, we're going one-on-one -on -one with attorney Eric Bland as he's giving us some insight into a case he's handling. Uh, this one was just filed. It's a father and a son who are accused in a murder case. Plus, Dio Beretton set to appear in court for the charges stemming from his attack on a Nevada judge last week. So he's going before another court today for this attack. Don't go away. Tonight on Court TV. These are the big cases that everyone is talking about. A lot of new developments taking place. Shocking. I know who killed John Bonet, to say the least. You cannot make this stuff up. It's uh, unreal. The scene of the double murders is behind us right here. Things are happening. The investigation is continuing. Closing arguments with Vinny Politan tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Welcome back to Opening Statements. This morning, we're shining a spotlight on two South Carolina farmers who were charged with murder. Ryan Lindler Sr. and Ryan Lindler Jr. are accused of gunning down their neighbor, Kevin Lester Newhouse, after he allegedly trespassed onto their property and swung a machete at the father and the son, striking each of them during that altercation. Now, police believe that the elder Lindler was able to disarm Newhouse prior to the shooting and then told his son to open fire. Both Lindlers are charged with murder and each have been released on $150,000 bond. Let's bring in their attorney now, our guest, Eric Bland. Eric, good morning to you. Always nice to see you. Uh, tell us, please, what happened you. in this case? Would you give us the facts, please? Sure. This is a very sad case. Um, it's in a rural area of Lexington County, South Carolina, where our clients have been born and bred and lived there their entire lives. And they're hardworking farmers that raise cattle and harvest hay. And the son, who's 26 years old, Ryan Jordan Jr., was building a house next to where the new houses lived in an area called Salida Circle. It is a very, very dangerous area. 
the police have had a lot of activity in that area. There was an officer who was shot in that area. Uh, it's a high crime area of uh, drugs and uh, meth, meth labs. And my client was, uh, my clients were delivering hay when the ring doorbell went off at the son's home. And he looked at his phone and it showed Kevin Newhouse with a pit bull walking on his property on the back porch with a machete and wearing a mask. And it's not the first time that Mr. Newhouse has trespassed on my client's property. Uh, my client was building a house and a lot of the materials had been taken. And Mr. Newhouse had been on other property these are all posted properties, Julie, where there is no trespassing signs. Gotcha. And he's been on other property with pit bulls that have not been chained uh, and leashed as required by the law. And he carries a machete with him at all times. And you don't go on somebody's property with a machete to trim tri trim hedges. You're going on there for a reason. And Ryan Lindler Sr. went to confront um, Kevin Newhouse they went back to his house. He was going to talk to his father about getting him help. You know, the system has failed Mr. Newhouse over the past five years. His behavior has gotten worse and worse. He goes on people's properties with the machete. He takes his shirt off. He screams and yells. The system has failed him. The, his family, his friends, everybody should have gotten him the mental health. And what ended up happening is when Mr. Senior went back on the property to go talk to his father, the uh, dogs were getting unruly. There's a lot of uh, pit bulls that are not leashed. They started to get unruly. Uh, Mr. Lindler asked him to please calm down. Um, and Kevin swung the machete, hit Mr. Lindler. At that same time, the son came up, saw his father's hand bleeding, um, grabbed Kevin Newhouse, and uh, a scuffle ensued. He thought based on appearances, that his life was in danger because he was reaching into his pockets. He pushed him down on the ground and uh, the son shot Kevin Newhouse. Uh, my client uh, has a CWP and was carrying a gun. It's a most unfortunate incident, um, but it's gonna be a case of self-defense and defense of others, defense of his father. But at the end of the day, it's the system that failed that caused this to happen because there are so many complaints that have been made about Mr. Newhouse trespassing on people's property, walking down the road with a machete and pit bulls, wearing a mask. And that's just not what you can do no. in a civilized society. It just makes people nervous. So it's a, oh, it's going to be a, um, a, a difficult case for all concerned. Right, Eric. Oh, it sounds like something out of a horror movie. People would be terrified yes. some guy wearing a mask with a loose pit bull and holding a machete in hand coming on their property. Uh, you don't think they're there to do something good, right? You hear that you think it's something out of, out of a horror movie and someone's looking to do someone else harm. Um, can I back up here? Because this, wow, as you know, this this is a lot here to to kind of digest. Just to clarify, please, Eric, whose property was it? You said it was the son's property that Kevin Lester Newhouse went on initially with the machete. And then yes. did the altercation right. claimed, that ensue claimed, there, or was there a break? No, he claimed that he was on the property to get his dog who was... Um, running away and not leashed. But when you see the video, the ring door video, the dog wasn't running away. He was looking in the window, uh, the back door of the house. What ended up happening is my clients uh, were at their parents' house and they drove to the son's house. Mr. New Mr. Uh, Lindler went to the new house house because he knew who it was and he was gonna to talk to his father. The son went to his property and when he drove up the driveway, he saw Kevin Newhouse scurrying in the woods. And so that's when he backtracked. The actual shooting took place on Kevin Newhouse's property. If it took place on the Lindler property, you have the stand your ground defense and the castle doctrine. But right. uh, because the shooting happened on Newhouse's property, which wasn't posted, um, that's why the murder charges were brought. I think they've clearly overcharged the, the father who was you know, the victim of a machete cut uh, he didn't have a weapon. He had a little bit of a, he had a half a broomstick. They're farmers. They use that broomstick to push cows into their corrals. So I think the father was overcharged. 
but we're going to have to go with the uh, self-defense. And, um, you know, it's just a bad situation. This 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 man, Mr. Newhouse, um, suffered from mental health issues and, and wasn't getting the care that he needs. And when you have this type of explosive confrontation with somebody with a machete and pit bulls, Mr. Lindler was bit by, the pit, by a pit bull on the property uh, in the back of his leg. So th my clients have no criminal background whatsoever. No uh, be my interactions question, ever Eric. with law enforcement. Yeah, law, nothing in their history. Abiding citizens, mm -hmm. nothing. And you mentioned Kevin Lester Newhouse uh, having been failed by the system. Do you know what his history is? I'm asking because I'm wondering if it's a violent criminal history. It could be a nonviolent history. So just curious if you know. No, no. The, there, there are allegations uh, that we are investigating that he had serious issues on a prior marriage uh, and uh, the children were involved. He had issues of uh, failure to stop for a blue light. All of these charges were dropped, obviously, after his death. Um, and there are uh, allegations of significant, significant drug use. And uh, but again, that's not a reason for somebody to be, to lose their life, but it's right. the the combustible nature of his background and what happened and what, having a machete. Mm -hmm. You know, civilized people don't carry around machetes. Right? No, certainly not. Certainly not, Eric. Uh, well, and he the, always carried a machete all his life. Really? Always. Oh my! Uh, yeah. Well, the, for the last five years, everywhere he went. You know, it's surprising some kind of altercation and it's so unfortunate as you know my friend that this one was a deadly altercation uh, and that he lost his life but it's surprising that there hasn't been something else because you can see why one would feel threatened with a, a large weapon like that uh you know being brought onto someone's property other property owners have called the police they have videos of him on their property in the middle of the night with the machete um you know the community is very uh much in support of the lindlers i had over 500 people julie at the bond hearing uh supporting the lindlers uh over a thousand letters have been sent to the solicitor in support of the lindlers there this community has been very frustrated because of the amount of crime in this small little enclave called salita circle uh there's um there will be testimony from a police officer that when he chased uh kevin newhouse uh into salita circle his supervisors told the officer don't go in there stop oh wow so the because officers were frustrated by this area yeah, yeah because, because of, of the danger of this of, whole community right, right. Uh, this is wow eric this is so sad i i know your uh, your heart goes out to the new house family of course no one wants to see a life lost yeah, sure certainly our hearts break uh for them uh but you know whether there's any legal culpability for your clients uh, there's a a great legal question uh you have to be able to answer you know with the court in the coming weeks so thank you for giving us the initial facts i know you'll keep us posted as the case thanks progresses. for having me on oh, always a pleasure eric bland Attorney, a Happy friend New of the year. show, thank you so much. Happy New Year to you and your beautiful family, Eric. We'll see you soon. All right, friends, when we come back, we're going to have the very latest on defendant Deobra Redden, you know, the guy that took the flying leap, attacking her honor in Nevada. Well, he's going to be in court today to answer to charges for this case. We're talking about it in Tipping the Scales. Connecticut mother goes missing. Now, her estranged husband's girlfriend stands trial for her alleged role in the disappearance. The Missing Mom Conspiracy Trial. Live coverage begins this week only on Court TV. There's no way we're gonna ever come up with this. We're moving closer to the trial in the case against Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. Welcome back to Opening Statements. Now it's time to talk about what is tipping the scales of justice. The man who leaped over the bench and attacked a judge last week in Las Vegas was in front of that same judge on Monday, shackled, surrounded by officers, wearing a spit mask, and he overread and stood before the Honorable Mary K. Holthus for his sentencing, which was delayed 
uh, due to his aerial attack. Uh, the punishment handed down by Holfus was connected to an attempted battery charge last year. It was actually a, an ag assault with a deadly weapon. It was reduced to attempted battery as part of the plea agreement, by the way. Uh, she addressed uh, the issue ahead of imposing the sentence, reassuring everyone involved in the case that her decision on sentence was not altered due to the attack. Let's listen. Any other issues that may arise from the events that occurred last Wednesday will be handled at a future date by a different court. For purposes of the record, I want to make it clear that I am not changing or modifying the sentence I was in the process of imposing last week before I was interrupted by defendant's actions. In accordance with the laws of the state of Nevada, this court does now sentence you in addition to the $25 administrative assessment fee, $150 DNA fee, the $3 DNA administrative assessment fee, and $250 indigent defense fee, 19 to 48 months in the Nevada Department of Corrections. All right, now this guy's going to go before a different judge today. We'll take you there live when it happens to answer to the charges connected to that assault. So how will the viral attack tip the scales against him? Let's bring in Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson on the couch with me. And attorney Eric Faddis is standing by remotely. Eric is a former prosecutor, currently does criminal defense work in the private sector. Eric, good to see you as well. All right, so Matt Johnson, you, early in your career, you've worked at many local states. Right. before going to network and mm -hmm. Las Vegas was one of the markets you worked in uh, you were familiar with the courthouse um, have you ever in all your trials you've covered seen anything like that never and you know I just I'm thinking about all of the different levels of security at this particular courthouse it's located in downtown there's a there's a homeless population around there they have extra added security of all the courthouses that I go to around the country there's like two metal detectors here like it's it's extra mm -hmm. and um, for them to um, you know, allow him to not have those restraints or those restrictions when he was facing a charge of battery and, and then, uh, you know, it just, it, it's a shame. It is, it because is my friend. Maybe there should have been more police and sheriff's deputies, Clark County sheriff's deputies around him to begin with. Right. You know, and I know hindsight's twenty twenty, right? I'm sure her honor, everybody, prosecutors, maybe even defense counsel, hoping that he would not have had a bond, that he would have been incarcerated on these charges awaiting his sentencing, and then wouldn't have been able to take that flying leap, attacking her honor and, and other staff members. Uh, with respect to the judge still sentencing him, Eric Faddis, I want to toss a really great legal question at you, please. Yesterday on this show, uh, Noah Pines, who I'm sure you've been on with, was our guest, and I thought he brought up an excellent point. He said that the judge should not follow through with the sentencing because now she's not going to be viewed as unbiased because this guy attacked her so brutally. And she made it clear on the record that her sentence didn't mm -hmm. change. Uh, but just for the sake of the appearance of any impropriety being avoided, uh, or this case coming back on appeal, which nobody wants, the judge doesn't want it, do you think she should have referred it to a colleague for sentencing? Judges have to avoid not only engaging in impropriety, but also the appearance of impropriety. Uh, and especially in this case where the world is now watching, you know, the entire nation saw this guy do a Superman leap over the bench and, and try to, you know, linebacker tackle this judge. Uh, it, I thought it was interesting that she chose to stay on the case and still do the sentencing, even though she made reference to, to the fact that, you know, that event did not affect her sentence whatsoever. There's still, uh, you know, raises some eyebrows about how could a human who, who was tackled like that um, not factor that into what, what they're going to do in terms of handing down the sentence to their attacker. Uh, and so I thought it was interesting that she still stayed on the case, but I thought she handled it really gracefully and, and um, appropriately well up there. She did. She exhibited a lot of restraint. I'm oh, sure yeah. it was hard to look at that guy, huh, Matt? Like, I mean, uh, she, she was really hurt, probably, yeah. by him. And other people were wiping away blood. Men, mm -hmm. sheriff's deputies, they were touching their hands and their faces. And, you know, he injured a lot of people with all of this. He did. Uh, Fifteen charges in all have been brought against him. And when he's in front of a new judge today, we're going to go in there live, see what happens. I would assume he's going to be 
looking a lot like he did yesterday with the spit mask mm -hmm. and uh, the hand restraints, all of that. Uh, so we'll keep you posted. Matt Johnson, great having you on the couch as always. Eric Faddish, you're coming along with us. That is all for opening statements, friends. You can watch or share this episode. Just go to CourtTV.com to do it. Click on the Shows tab.